Right, okay, uh, Friday afternoon, and I would like to welcome all the attendees to uh, this uh, another webinar in the, the Goose series of webinars. Today we have a really excellent and interesting presentation coming from Tom Cuff, who is the director of the NOAA's uh, National Weather Service Ocean Prediction Center, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, the connections and the challenges and opportunities uh, from observations to service delivery in maritime weather. So I'm going to hand over to you, uh, uh, Tom, in a minute, just to say that his presentation will be about half an hour, uh, and then we hopefully have half an hour for um, some questions after that. And if you want to ask a question on the right-hand side, down towards the, the bottom of the kind of the webinar uh, panel, you should see something that sees, says questions, and that will be the interface um, with which to, to, to type in the questions, and then I'll come back and, and moderate those questions after the presentation. So I will hand over now to, to Tom, um, and looking forward to the presentation. Great, thanks. All right, thank you, Emma. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, Thank you for taking time out of your Friday afternoon to, uh, uh, to tune in and, and uh, uh, learn a little bit about uh, how we apply uh, some of the observations that, uh, that are so very useful for a number of purposes and apply them to maritime weather. So what I'll do is uh, recognizing that a, 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 there are a number of observational lists on this, uh, this webinar as opposed to a number of forecasters. Uh, I intend to present to you from the perspective of a forecaster. So many of the charts that you will see will be the kinds of displays that the marine forecasters here at the Ocean Prediction Center actually see in order to uh, to conduct their uh, uh, to conduct and, and make their forecasts. So moving on to the next slide, slide two. Um, I think. Let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. Let me just give you a couple of bottom lines up front. Uh, first of all, uh, want to make sure it's clear to everybody on the line that experienced forecasters actually issue the warnings and forecasts and they relate the impacts of the weather that's uh, expected to the uh, uh, local uh, users. Uh, and that's to differentiate that from forecast models which simply produce the guidance. I think uh, uh, many of us are used to the idea that the app that we've got on our phone or looking at the model forecast uh, prediction on the computer is actually the forecast. But as you'll see as we go through this webinar that uh, uh, the model guidance is just one input for, into the forecasters for the, for the final product. Second of all, I hope to be able to make the connection for all of you on how important observations in the maritime environment are as critical inputs to the forecast process. Uh, I also uh, hope to, to demonstrate for you that in the future, fully coupled models, uh, that is air, sea, and, and, and uh, and, and ice models are going to lead to improved maritime forecast, and that's also going to require closer interaction, not only amongst the oceanography and weather communities, but also the research and operational communities, and those will be key to success. And then I'll show you a few examples at the end of how we need to continue to, to improve and modernize product and service delivery to ships at sea. So I'll move on to slide number three, and I'll apologize for the US-centric perspective of this slide. Uh, but I think it's important to highlight here why we do this and why we worry about this. Maritime weather is, is a critical component of safe navigation. In fact, uh, the two components of that are the weather and understanding what obstacles and, and, and obstructions in the water depth are. So in terms of maritime safety information, what I'm showing to you on this slide in, in, by boxes and as segregated by the black lines are the med areas as defined by uh, JCOM for actual national responsibilities for providing hazardous weather warning services. The green lines that are underneath this chart highlight a year's worth of ship tracks from 2014. And, and, I, and I show that to make sure it's clear to everyone that ships traveling along these routes encounter uh, extreme weather quite, a, quite often throughout the year. And these ship routes are the, uh, uh, these ship routes, uh, 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 are the source or the transportation linkage for about 90% of the world economy. So about $13 trillion worth of goods travel along these sea routes 
and experience heavy weather. Not only that, but about 2 billion passengers per year, although mostly on ferries, but also on cruise ships actually travel on the high seas. So it's the, it's the collective responsibility of the maritime forecast agencies around the world to ensure that these cargo are trans, uh, transported safely and, and uh, with minimal damage. And the same, of course, is true for the people that, that are on the high seas. Moving on to slide four, now you can compare the previous slide with this global uh, uh, summary of 150 years worth of tropical cyclone tracks. And you can see that sea lanes travel across uh, many of these tropical cyclone tracks, particularly along the west coast of, uh, sorry, the east coast of North America and the east coast of the Asian continent, uh, as well as uh, throughout Oceania. So, so this is a threat, a maritime threat that I think all of us are very familiar with, and this also gathers a lot of attention because of the intensity of tropical cyclones um, and, 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 and uh, the uh, impact that they have on coastal areas as well as shipping. But it, what may not be as well known to many people, as we'll show on slide five, is that extratropical cyclones or mid-latitude cyclones that develop farther north throughout the year are just as threatening. And in fact, uh, thanks to scatterometer data available from the European METOP satellites, we've got about a 11 or 12 year climatology now of, of uh, extreme winds over the North Atlantic and North Pacific Ocean. The Ocean Prediction Center here in Washington, D.C. is responsible for providing hazardous weather warnings for much of the North Atlantic and North Pacific, uh, north of latitude 30 degrees. So we're concerned about the frequency of extreme tropical, extratropical cyclones in those areas. The bright areas of heat map uh, clearly indicate the areas where hurricane force winds throughout the year uh, are, are most frequent and then blue are the areas where it's less frequent. And I want to highlight the fact that these are hurricane force winds that are not the result of tropical cyclones, but they're the result of extratropical cyclones. What we see is that these wind events happen on the order of 45 to 50 times per year in the North Atlantic and I'll use my mouse to help highlight the area of cyc primary cyclogenesis, and about 35 to 45 times per year across the North Pacific. So we have typically between 80 and 100 hurricane force winds events that are not tied to tropical cyclones. And as you recall from the earlier slide, most of the major ship tracks across the world transit through these areas. So it's very important that we, we do the best we can to highlight these hazardous areas. And I'll talk a little bit about the forecast process for doing so, as well as how observations feed into that. Um, but I do wanna highlight two, two images on the right side. The first of which here is uh, on, on the upper right-hand corner of the slide. That's damage on a cruise ship that had sustained uh, uh, winds of uh, uh, over 120 knots for about three hours off the North Carolina coast of North America two years ago. And, and the passengers had a fairly rough ride. In fact, that ship had 6,100 people on board and that ship was in peril for some time. In the lower right corner is a ship that just recently uh, lost about 75 containers off the coast of North Carolina in March, uh, in the same reason actually as the earlier ship, but uh, two and a half years later. And as you can see, that ship took a great deal of damage and, and the cargo was lost. Unfortunately, that happens all too often. Furthermore, um, as we move on to, uh, to, to slide six, um, I've got the cover of two reports that, that have just been released by, uh, within the U.S. federal government within the last few months that highlight marine incidents that are the result of extreme weather. On the left, you see the cover referring to the sinking of the U.S. cargo ship El Faro, which sunk in the Bahamas in October 2015 with Hurricane Joaquin, bringing, uh, all, uh, uh, so, uh, killing all souls on board. On the right, you see the cover of a report by the U.S. Committee on the Marine Transportation System. This was a report to Congress that was requested by Congress um, as a result of incidents such as the El Faro, but also some of the cruise ship incidents similar to the one I referred to earlier, trying to understand how we can do a better job with maritime uh, weather prediction and particularly in transmitting information from the National Hydrometeorological Services, in this case, the National Weather Service, which may in fact be doing a very good job with the weather forecast, but somehow or another it is not getting out to the maritime community. These reports also talk about issues relating to transferring observations to and from the ship, so I'll touch briefly on that. But really the thrust is how to ensure 
that the impacts of the weather are better understood by the maritime community and how to make sure that they make the right decisions. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So with that, that introduction, I'll talk a little bit about the U.S. concept of weather-ready nation, uh, and, and I'll extrapolate that further into how we can become a maritime weather-ready nation and some of the steps we need to take for that. And then I'll more broadly talk about how observations, forecasting, and dissemination can be strengthened for the global maritime weather enterprise. Moving on to slide eight, this is just an overview of the National Weather Service's maritime, uh, or sorry, National Weather Service's Weather Ready Nation program. And the idea behind Weather Ready Nation is to ensure that we've got a ready, responsive, and resilient society. Uh, having com community resiliency in the face of increased vulnerability by extreme weather, water, and climate events. And there are a number of pieces that are key to this. Uh, one of them is clearly better forecasts and, 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 and making sure that actual in well, information is provided to the public, but it's also about making sure that the weather, water, and climate enterprise are working together to connect the forecast to decisions that are being made by the population. On slide nine, one of the uh, highlight, one of the key pieces to that is actually the concept of impact-based decision support services. Realizing that weather forecasts are only as valuable as, as the uh, decisions that are being made with them, one of the efforts that we're focusing on with our weather forecast offices in the U.S. is not just generating the forecasts and warnings, but being able to connect those forecasts and warnings with impacts, being able to convey what is going to happen, for example, in a particular flood scenario, what's going to happen in a particular tornado or even a heat or a fire scenario, making sure that the emergency managers are aware of what the potential range of uh, impacts of the weather are and how those impacts can be mitigated as much as possible in advance, how relief supplies can be provided in advance to ensure that, that the population is as ready as possible. So how do we translate this into the marine world? I think over land and along the coastlines where we've got a heavy population, I think that a lot of that is very intuitive on how that can positively impact uh, people's behavior um, by, by connecting those forecasts with the warnings and impact, but that gets a little more challenging at sea. So on slide 10, I highlight uh, a little bit about the uh, Ocean Prediction Center strategic plan and how we're trying to achieve a maritime weather ready nation. Um, how we can further prevent the loss of lives and property and enhance the U.S. economy by strengthening partnerships with the Coast Guard, with the shipping industries and the private sector weather providers that are giving tailored services to the shipping industry to ensure that they, they understand the authoritative information that is being produced by the National Weather Service so that they can get that information out to their users. We're also looking internally at our at our. Um, and our workflow to try to try to extend the range of our maritime forecast beyond the four-day window we usually operate on for for weather at sea, uh, and and do that by optimizing the use of, of observations both in situ and remote, um, uh, uh, taking a better look at how the Earth system prediction capability is going to evolve to to couple the ocean, ice, and, and atmosphere models for better forecasts. Make sure those forecasts continue to improve and that we continue to train the forecasters on how to take advantage of all of this new technology and how do we deliver that information to ships at sea and how do we move into the 21st century with that. We also, as I mentioned just a little bit early in terms of model predictions and, and combining the atmosphere waves or atmosphere ice and ocean, that's becoming critically important as activities in the maritime Arctic uh, increase and we need to make sure that uh, uh, that we're taking advantage of, of the intellectual capability of our forecasters as well as the investments in numerical weather prediction to improve forecasts in that region and we also need to continue to work on improving the linkages among topography hydrography bathymetry ocean and weather to make sure we do a better job of highlighting the threat of inundation to coastal populations now I think all of these areas have are applicable around the world. So that's why I wanted to go ahead and provide them here. Um, and, and within the Joint uh, Commission on Oceanography and Meteor Marine Meteorology, JCOM, on the Services and Forecast Systems Program area, we're taking a look, look at how we can further advance that. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Now, moving on to slide 11, in terms of typical maritime weather, uh, weather information, for those who are not familiar, uh, with that and are, are more focused on the observation ends of our very important business. Um, I think it's important to understand that uh, the way 
what kinds of information are produced for ships at sea and how that information gets transmitted. So I'll just very briefly show you a few slides uh, highlighting some of that, a very small portion of that information. Some of our legacy and, and, and highest uh, utility products are, are the surface analysis. Um, this is the, 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 the traditional uh, plot showing the lows and high pressure systems, but also uh, highlighting, as you see here with the mouse, areas of storm force and developing gale force winds. Uh, the blue dotted line highlighting where the ice edge. So the idea here is to highlight not just not just to show a weather map to the mariners, but to highlight the information that's going to provide them a better better indication of where the threats actually are. Moving on to slide 12, we actually produce a wind wave analysis where we overlay wave heights and feet along with the wind barbs for the observations that we may get um, in a certain area. Um, and, and then we, we, we transmit that out to ships as well. We also produce charts in 24 hour intervals up to 96 hours. Again, highlighting the areas of threatening weather in, in this chart on slide 13, for example, we're showing areas of gale force, near gale force winds, as well as the persistence of the ice edge. And on slide 14, we also do the same thing with winds and waves so that although we've now converted to meters rather than feet, to conform to international standards to ensure that mariners know where they should avoid the uh, rough seas that may impact their, their operations. And of course, the mariners and the ship operators themselves understand what their limits are. So we let them determine that. Now, moving on to slide 15, this is also another legacy product. And, and this is part of the global maritime distress and safety system, providing the information to ships at sea who, who, who don't really have any means to copy digital information. And so this is basically an excerpt of a teletype broadcast that's produced jointly for the North Atlantic by the Ocean Prediction Center and the National Hurricane Center. And, it's, and as you can see, it's a very detailed summary of where weather pressure centers are, where they're forecast to move, and where hazardous winds and seas are forecast uh, to, uh, to, to occur. One of the comments I'll just make on this and one of the takeaways that I think many of you may be having as you look at this is, this seems like an awful lot of information for a mariner to digest out at sea, and what can they do with that? And, and that's a valid concern and, right, and one that we're also looking at, um, how we can find better ways to do, do this in the, in the future. In the meantime, we do make sure that we highlight as, as clearly as possible where the hazardous weather is. For example, the storm warnings that are highlighted in the, in the left uh, and center columns here, as well as the gale warning in the North Atlantic. Now, how do we know uh, how well we're doing? More specifically, how do we know what kind of impact we're having on mariners? That's a, that's a great challenge for us. And on slide 16, what I try to highlight here is, is is an effort to, to to at least graphically depict when we're successful. This is a situation where in the center lower panel you can see a hurricane force low was forecast to develop off the east coast of the United States. The pet the polygon on the right side uh, pardon me on the left side highlights an area where uh, automated information systems uh, show ship positions in the area that's expected to receive hurricane force winds uh, in, in the next 48 hours. On the plot 48 hours later with the low uh, uh, fully developed and causing hurricane force winds, you can see that there are very few ships in that, that normally well-traveled area. So at least graphically, we can say we've gone from 46 ships in a certain area to 13 ships with a number of them crowded near the coast. So this is a situation where we'd like to say that we were successful. However, we still have lots of challenges in this and, in, and I'll highlight that on the next slide. For those on the line from the US, you might be familiar with the fact that in March, the college uh, basketball tournament occurs where we take uh, 64 colleges from around the country and they, 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 they fight basketball, uh, uh, play basketball mat matches to determine the national champion. That's called March Madness. However, for those who uh, are familiar with weather patterns over the North Atlantic this, this year, uh, March Madness refers to the number of, ex of very strong storms over the, over the region uh, this past March. What you're looking for, uh, pardon me, what you're looking at on this slide is, is, a, is a broad area of winds forecast to be in excess of gale force winds covering much of the North Atlantic over a 24 hour period. So this was a briefing slide that we were sharing with some of our core partners, such as the US Navy and the US Coast Guard to highlight the threats. So we, we were 
we were uh, uh, probably four to five days in advance of this, highlighting an extensive area of weather conditions uh, that were, were, were quite extreme. Well, the Navy responded by telling their ships to stay out of a huge chunk of the North Atlantic. The Coast Guard responded by actually closing the entrance of the Chesapeake Bay to try to keep the traffic out of there uh, uh, and, and to try to minimize any possibility of damage. Yet when I look at the AIS plot for that area, you can see that at the height of the storm, we still had far too many ships in the area of the storm. So one of the challenges is not only how we get the information to the ship to make the better decisions for them, but how far in advance does the forecast need to be to ensure they have the right information. In this particular instance, this storm was so large that if storms didn't re begin responding four to five days in advance, they had no choice but to be caught in the storm. And that's the situation that as maritime forecasters, we need to get past. Now, in terms of observations, um, what do we have available over the ocean? And I think uh, many, many on this call are, are at least as familiar or more familiar with this than I am. But just to very briefly highlight, uh, we do have altimeter data, um, which, which uh, I, I know many on this this uh, call are used to looking at this for for uh, for sea height, uh, sea level height um, to uh, monitor for, for, for warming uh, over the oceans and climate change. However, what we use the altimeters for from, from uh, are to measure wave heights. So this is the first pass of the Jason 3 altimeter. You're looking in the Northwest Atlantic. And what we're seeing here is swaths about seven kilometers wide showing wave heights and feet. So we're getting some very good definition of what the waves are. In fact, where I've got the mouse here, we're seeing 16 to 18 foot seas. Um, to the south of Greenland, which is which is pretty extreme. However, even with the number of altimeters that are flying globally right now, that information uh, we only get a repeat order, uh, orbit over a specific location every five days. Um, that's not very frequent for weather forecasting, as you can imagine. Moving on to slide 19. Well, we do get uh, you know very pleased with the ocean surface vector winds that are provided by the European METOP satellites. But unfortunately, those two are polar orbiting satellites. We don't have continuous coverage, and therefore we have gaps. Um, the colors on this chart go from light blue for uh, light winds to uh, yellow and orange, indicating gale force winds, to maroon and brown for storm force winds, and bright red for hurricane force winds. Um, you can just barely see some hurricane force winds on this slide, but we've missed defining a hurricane force low um, off the coast of, uh, of New England in the northwestern Atlantic because we just didn't have enough passes to, to, to cover that area. Now, we are very pleased to have GO-16, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, providing much uh, very similar uh, capabilities uh, as the, the latest uh, uh, version of Himawari and, and Umetsat satellites. What you're looking at here is about a 24-hour loop of a rapidly developing nor'easter um, uh, off the coast of the U.S. in January. And what you're seeing here in, with the color flashes, that's actually the uh, uh, lightning, surface lightning that's being detected by the satellite. And, and what this is enabling us to do is get a better idea of where storms may be intensifying very rapidly. And, and often this happens in situations where it's not forecast. So let me put this all together into a case study that talks a little bit more about some of the in situ op, op, uh, observations that many of you all are providing. We had a coastal storm about two years ago off the coast of the US, and this is a situation that actually uh, uh, became the center of attention for, for the cruise ship I referred to earlier that had 120 knot winds. As much as four days in advance of the storm, we recognize with the help of uh, numerical weather prediction, of course, um, but also uh, our knowledge of, of, of patterns uh, that our forecasters have, that there was going to be a very intense storm off the US, US East Coast, and it was gonna be a little bit farther south than these storms normally track. Um, in fact, inside of the four day forecast shown here with the verification on the right, which was actually pretty good, um, by day three before the storm, we, we actually increased the forecast for hurricane force winds. And by day two, we had an extensive area of hurricane force wind warnings out. Showing here is just a quickly, I'll show briefly a satellite image from GOES 14 before we had the new series of GOES highlighting the number of uh, the, the rapid intensification of this, this storm off the Carolina coast. Typically, these storms develop further to the north, so we were, we were very concerned about making sure ships got the information as quickly as possible. As you can see from this 
this, uh, these one minute satellite images that we specially requested at the time, um, there's some very rapid intensification going on. So without the satellite information we had available, how else would our forecasts know that we had this sort of rapid intensification ongoing for such a severe system? Well, unfortunately, because we were we, we weren't able to get so many ships out of the way for such a large storm. Um, we did have a number of ships that were a lot closer to the storm than we would have liked. And part of that, again, would do is owing to the fact that the storm was farther south than usual. So this plot of, uh, from AIS, ships reporting the IAS, show there were an extensive number of ships out there. So since so, uh, you know, we were all keenly aware of the, the, the volunteer observing ship program and other similar programs, we'd like to think that we had a, a large number of ships op observations out there. So I moved to slide 24, which is the forecast, the, the plot that the forecasters were actually using at the time to analyze the situation. The, uh, the, the box outlined in white here indicates the area you were just looking at in the previous chart with all the ships. And it looks like you've got a handful of observations and it, yeah, we do indeed have a low pressure system. We do have 160 knot wind report. Um, unfortunately, as you can guess from, uh, see from the previous slide, there were a lot more ships in, in the region than that. So if I were to just take this plot, which shows buoys and ship reports, and just highlight the ship reports, you can see that there are only two ships in the entire Northwest Atlantic that were reporting weather at the time. One fortunately was close enough to the coast to, to highlight the fact that, yeah, we probably did have hurricane force winds near that low, but we didn't have many ship reports at all. So this is an area of emphasis that we're working with both the ship observing team program and JCOM, but also uh, uh, with, with, uh, within, within the U, at least within the US, so some other channels that try to improve our ability to get information from ships. However, for, for, for Goose and for many of the folks on this call, I'd like to go back one slide to slide 24 and highlight the buoy network and the incredible value that not only the fixed buoys provide, in at least giving us some understanding of what's happening, but also the drifting buoys, as you can see here. Um, they provide additional useful information that forecasters really desperately need. Now, of course, if I'm to, I was to compare that to the surface observation network over land, um, you can see the density of a typical surface plot over the US shows an awful lot of observations. And, and, and I would certainly never try to make the case that we should have a, as, as extensive a, a network of surface observations over the water as we're gonna have over land, where in this case, there are 330 million people. But I do think that the previous plots highlight the, 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 the need to get more information from ships. Now, referring to that cruise ship, we did have a ship in the area that was collecting weather information. We know that because this, this was a Twitter shot taken from the stateroom of one of the passengers on the cruise ship that went through the system. And you can see that um, this ship was reporting 106 knots of wind. Now, we've looked at these records and that was probably likely a gust at that, a momentary gust, but winds, we, we were able to confirm from the ship information that up at a height of about 60 to 70 meters where the anemometers were located, that ship had 120 knots sustained winds for about three hours. And you can see the ship's only making about 2.7 knots over water, but that wasn't the highest Twitter observation we saw. We actually saw one of 143 knots a little while later as the truck as the ship was trying to make its way northward. Now you can see it's showing a speed of 7.4 knots. Um, we actually plotted the positions of the ship and the ship was not moving to the north northeast at 7.4 knots. It was actually moving sideways at 7.4 knots. So clearly the ship was in a situation that it didn't want to be in. However, we didn't have those observations until after the fact. And after some clear testing, we know that observations received over Twitter don't make Twitter don't make it into GTS. They don't make it into the uh, uh, the weather observation network. They can't help the forecast, and and they can't help the models. So uh, this is an area where we're trying to work with the, the shipping industries to try to ensure that this information gets distributed as much as possible. Now, fortunately, we did have a good scatterometer pass that covered the storm, but scatterometers, uh, certainly on, on, on the current version of, uh, of METOP satellites, has some limitations. We've got a few areas of 65 knot winds, but what I want to highlight is the region in which this happened. And this is happening along the north wall of the Gulf Strait. And, and I'll get to 
what we were beginning to see with this uh, in just a moment. But this is an area where we need the observationalists who are taking good observations along the major ocean currents to work with the modelers who are trying to integrate the air and the atmosphere information to improve the quality of our forecast because this information is not being adequately captured in numerical weather prediction models. Fortunately, our forecasters know and try to advise their forecast to account for that. In terms of altimeter data, however, I just wanted to highlight here briefly that the altimeter was of no use because the altimeter passes that we had around the time of that storm just were too far away. So we didn't have that independent look. Fortunately, we did have a few buoys and on slide, that were in the area. And on slide 30, I just wanted to highlight that, the, 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 again, the value of having a buoy in the right place at the right time. And as you can see, in this case, the wave heights increased from four meters to seven meters in one hour. Um, for those of you who have been to sea, I know all of us feel that, you know, are aware of the fact that wave heights can, can increase rapidly when the winds increase rapidly. But I have to be, admit, I was pretty surprised at that kind of an increase. And in fact, uh, we had nine meter seas measured uh, by that buoy for, for a few hours. I talked just a moment ago about some of the challenges with forecasting where the, where the major ocean currents uh, cross uh, are impacted by, by cold outbreaks and these nor'easters. In the lower right hand panel of this plot here, you can see that we had a nor'easter. Uh, off the coast of, of the U.S. This is one of many that had, this was the large storm, in fact, uh, early in March, and we were fortunate enough to have an altimeter pass that went right over the Gulf Stream during the height of the severe winds. And, and I want to let you know that the forecast models predicted about 29 to 30 foot seas here uh, in, in terms of Wave Watch 3. Um, the, for, the, the models assimilated roughly 30 foot seas in that area. But as you can see with the colored graphics in the background, uh, highlighting colored uh, sea surface temperatures that were not colored by clouds and, and inferring that in this area here where you go from the greens to the red is where the North World of Gulf Stream was, wave heights increased from 28 to about 41 feet over a very short range, um, over actually over about uh, 10 to 15 kilometers. So this is an area that we need the observational communities and the weather and ocean communities to work more closely with the modelers to try to figure out how we can do a better job of predicting this and getting the information out. Another forecast challenge we've got is in the Arctic, and this is where we need some, some additional observations as well. Now, so based on satellite observations, the, National, the U.S. National Light Center, as well as the ICE centers in, in, in many of uh, uh, the, the, the states boarding the Arctic, produce uh, regular ICE analyses, and they cooperate in a forum of, in JCOM through the expert team on sea ice and then also through the inner National Ice Charting Working Group. Uh, this is actually a plot from last week showing the coverage of sea ice in the Arctic. And then on the right is an actual indication of uh, numbers of icebergs counted by the U.S. Coast Guard's International Ice Patrol per one degree square of latitude and longitude. And what you can see here, and again, going back to your pre one of the earlier slides, you can see we've got icebergs that are impacting the sea lane. So remembering that icebergs really uh, in, in the Titanic was the cause of, of a lot of the organization that we presently see in the uh, uh, maritime, in, for the coordination of maritime uh, safety uh, meteorological information. How can we do a better job of integrating this kind of sea ice and iceberg information with the ocean and weather and soon to be coupled models to try to improve and pr provide improved services for mariners? And I highlight that challenge in slide 33. How do we work together to get that information out? Now, the final challenge I wanted to talk about um, is, is how we get the information to ships at sea. So our fork, this is a, a, a chart from uh, last year, uh, last October of the North Pacific. So our forecasters, uh, you know, in this case, put together a 48-hour surface chart to highlight the areas of extreme weather. Um, in this case, hurricane force winds moving uh, into the Bering Sea from this major low pressure system in the Aleutians and a couple of areas of gale and storm force winds. Well, to get this information to ships at sea that don't have the ability or don't choose to pay for internet access in the middle of the ocean, which can be quite expensive, we actually transmit this through HF radio facsimile. So the first thing we do is we turn this into a fine product into a black and white chart and try to adjust it so it's readable. We then send those out over, uh, over uh, HF radio. U.S. Coast Guard runs five broadcast stations around the U.S., and I believe there's a total of 25 
facsimile stations worldwide transmitting this information. However, if any of you have tried to capture this information at sea, the chart may start out like this. If you're lucky, you get this. Uh, as we see on slide 36, you can see a fairly readable chart. And, and, and fortunately, that's what we, we hope to see most of the time. Unfortunately, very often we see a chart like we've got on slide 37, where it's somewhat garbled and some of the details a little difficult to read. But once in a while, as you'll see on slide, slide 38, we sometimes see charts garbled like this. And I think those of you who have tried to copy back to broadcast that see, see this more often than you would like. Um, what you don't see very clearly in here is the area of hazardous weather, of course. I can make out a 40 knot wind barb in the word gale, so I know there's bad weather out there, but this isn't very actionable information. So what are we trying to do about that? Well, we're trying to work with the uh, International Hydrographic Organization and, and, and JCOM to try to develop a standard for actually integrating the charting information for nautical charts with weather warning information that can be produced by national meteorological and hydrological services to try to integrate that hazard information on navigation charts. Um, that's an ongoing project for this S412 standard is what it's called, and that's uh, we'll continue to work through that. Finally, in terms of how we broaden all of this internationally, how we uh, take a more global approach to, 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 to maritime weather and, and improving safety in a maritime weather ready nation, if you will, a maritime weather ready world, um, the uh, Joint Commission on Oceanography and Marine Meteorology's uh, Services and Forecast Systems Program area recently uh, adjusted their their structure to try to reflect the, re the evolving requirements of the community, to try to strengthen the position of those national marine services that are providing the authoritative safety information to ships at sea, and try to continue to enhance the focus of safety and life of property at sea, not only on the high seas, but also in the coastal zones and in the polar regions, and really try to improve the alignment of the information to try to support uh, a fully integrated maritime safety information. Moving on to slide 41, Part of that vision continues to talk about uh, building resiliency in marine service delivery through the global, through the establishment identification of global data processing and forecasting systems, and being able to enhance the support and response for marine environmental emergencies and focusing on disaster risk reduction. And very broadly speaking, uh, uh, for, for those who uh, who want to reach out to the JCOM website, this is actually the new structure. Um, we now have a worldwide Med Ocean Information and Warning Service Committee that used to be the expert team on marine safety services. Um, we've got the, we've established national marine services focal points to try to improve the ability of countries to work within their med areas to, and, and uh, uh, get the latest safety information out. We're, we're, we're establishing uh, permanent expert teams on uh, marine environmental emergency responses focusing more on disaster uh, uh, resiliency and response and really trying to uh, increase cooperation on, on uh, coupled ocean, operational ocean forecasting with the atmosphere as well as the expert teams on sea ice, which has been longstanding. So what I hope we've done in, in the course of the last half hour or so is provide some thoughts on how we can improve the global maritime weather information, uh, pardon me, global maritime weather enterprise. It's important that we continue to strengthen the dialogue between the maritime weather and ocean communities, but also between the ops and research communities. And, and this is also an area where I think tighter uh, uh, connectivity with programs such as GOOSE and, and, and GCOS, for example, in ensuring that we get the right kinds of observational information collected that support not only climate records, but also support the uh, hazardous uh, warnings and forecasts for, for ships at sea. I think we can continue to work to improve on that and develop these integrated products and services that meet the requirements and help our users at sea make optimal decisions where they're so vulnerable and need to make those decisions. And of course, we want to ensure that we get more observations where and when we need them. We want to improve the dissemination products and try to get out of the 1930s technology that we're still uh, relying so heavily on, as, as I showed you with the HF facsimile broadcast as an example. But also, we want to continue to build partnerships to ensure that the authoritative hazardous weather warnings are disseminated. And with that, I apologize. I think I've gone over just over 30 minutes. But uh, that concludes my prepared remarks. And, and Emma, I'm happy to take comments. And questions thank you great thank you thank you that was a really interesting presentation and i'm going to perhaps i'll ask uh, one of the the first questions if i if i may it was um i i i'm 
kind of fundamentally interested in the sort of the extending the range of uh, maritime forecasts. You kind of touched on that mm -hmm. and you're sort of into seasonal forecasts and things like that, I guess. Will, will the needs for observations change uh, dramatically, you know, when you're looking at seasonal forecasts, do you need different types of observations or are you looking really for, for a similar mix of uh, satellite and uh, all of these things? Do you do you need deeper observations, for example, deeper in the ocean um, to, to get the, the, the circulation patterns and things like this? Yeah, great question. I think uh, uh, I'll try to separate this into a few parts. Um, from the perspective of maritime weather, I think what we need to do is, is, is extend the forecast range of the hazardous weather warnings uh, from the present three to four days out to 10 days and beyond. And that's sort of similar to what we see happening to, to land-based and terrestrial weather. Um, I think there's a scenario we just haven't pursued that much um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, part, part of what we need to be able to do is provide information regarding the, the confidence we have in the information coming from the numerical weather prediction models and to try to uh, produce some sort of uh, probabilistic based product that highlights areas of forecast hazardous weather. Um, so that's so in terms of observations, I, I think that's where clearly once you, you know, like anything else over the ocean, we would need more observations over the water to be able to do that. Um, and, I, and yeah, I certainly believe that having more information on uh, on subsurface water conditions as well, as well as surface conditions will help improve the models, particularly as we shift into a coupled uh, modeling regime. I think another piece of this becomes uh, the Arctic and, and, and also the Southern Ocean, quite frankly, with, with the, uh, of course, the, the ice problems, the Southern Ocean are significantly different than in the Arctic because of the, where the land and the ocean are, if you will, relative to the poles. Uh, but I think uh, the more information that we've got over the ocean at deeper depths, um, will certainly continue to improve our ability, not only to extend the, uh, the range of maritime weather forecasts out to 10 days and beyond, but improve our ability to uh, predict uh, sea ice uh, melting and freezing up of, of the ice edge, as well as movement of the ice edge over time. Um, over, the, over the short term, um, that's, the ice edge is very heavily influenced as uh, those who are, live up in the high latitudes know it's very heavily influenced by the storm tracks. So as we have a better handle on the storm track over extended periods of time, we can do a better job forecasting the movement of the sea ice. Um, and then of course, from a seasonal to seasonal perspective, once we've got more information about the water depth and we've got a uh, better resolution on the, on, the, on the ocean models that are feeding the climate modules, uh, models, pardon me, and yeah, I think we'll do a better job with that. Does that answer your question? It does indeed, thank you very much. And I was also, it's like a follow on question. So if we're looking at, um, you know, taking uh, more observations. We, we have new technologies coming online uh, with ocean observations such as ocean gliders. Uh, you mentioned better observations of the Gulf Stream and I know that there are some ocean gliders operating um, on a regular basis in the in the Gulf Stream and then we have uh, other technologies such as a sail drone sort of crossing the the Pacific doing kind of really big long tracks. Do you do you look to these new technologies to to really be a big part of um, uh, providing the, the the new observations or uh, did you touch into those communities for example? We're certainly trying to stay in touch with them and where and where, where it's appropriate, we're trying to help them uh, think about where they place some of these uh, the, these assets. Um, what, I, what I very much like about, uh, about gliders as well as the sail drone concepts are they provide a means of collecting relatively persistent data in a relatively small area yet, yet still give the ability to move around into threat areas. Of course, they can't move that quickly, uh, but no. they, they, they do provide some, some degree of persistence um, in areas where we may not have it at, at the present time. Um, I also am aware of some efforts underway, some experiments underway to try to try, and, and some that I've done in the past, of course, to try to to try to position gliders in the path of tropical cyclones, for example. And then there's some talk yeah. to the thing with extratropical cyclones to do a better job of, uh, of sampling the subsurface ocean conditions to assimilate that information in the models to try to determine what kind of an impact that 
the, 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 the heat capacity in the ocean ahead of that uh, tropical or extratropical cyclone uh, might have on, on intensity and current forecast. Well, pardon me, intensity forecast. Yeah, and I mean, maybe this is a, I mean, it's, it just occurs to me as a question. Um, and I would encourage the audience to find the question button as well, because maybe it's uh, not easy to locate, but you, you can type questions in. I'm, I'm really happy to kind of continue asking Tom some questions because I got a whole bunch of them. But please, you know, audience, feel, feel free to, to input some questions as well in the toolbar for the, um, for the GoToMeeting, uh, you should be able to locate something that says questions, and there you can you can type in a question. Um, I, I guess I was wondering because I think um, maybe you know historically the the, the Met services have um, have integrated um, some of the ship observations, but not all the observations from the oceanographic community. When you go to the Met service, I, I guess big meetings, the conventions, do you hear a lot more? discussion about the role of observations or? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and, and we're certainly raising that question. Um, you know, we're hearing that the number of, uh, uh, of observations uh, that, that are actually being seen by at forecast centers and, and integrated into the forecast models has really has dropped precipitously in recent years. Um, so we're trying to work with groups like the JCOMS uh, ship observations team and others to try to to try to along with some of the liaison activities we're undertaking from a services perspective to try to get the information out that that information really is important um and um and and, and using that cruise ship as an example you know they're they're there may, maybe they weren't aware that they could be submitting that observation somehow or another. Yeah. So, you know, so 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 we're we're expanding our, our liaison with these activities. Um, there may have been concerns in the past about, uh, for example, some cargo ships not wanting to to let their competition know where they're located. Uh, but I think uh, first of all, uh, maritime security needs to have kind of overcome that, so they're already reporting their position. So you might as well report the weather um, because. Yeah. Uh, uh, reporting that weather information, it will help us in the National Meteorological Hydrological Services do a better job of providing services. Absolutely. And what do you think is the biggest barrier to to getting more ships involved? I mean, do you have any feedback from from this kind of uh, outreach that you've been doing in this area? Yeah, we're 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 we're, we're working to to expand our, our liaison with the with the users community users to try to better understand that. Um, so, so I, I will say that one part of this has clearly been the smaller crews. Okay, so if, if uh, when we think about what's required through some programs such as the Volunteer Observing Ship Program and the training that's required for that and the level of effort to try to, to take those observations and send them, with smaller crews, that's becoming more and more challenging. I mean, these very small crews have an awful lot to do to try to keep their, their cargo safe, their ship operating and safe and, and, and yeah. that additional load. So to, to the extent that we can automate the collection yeah. of the key parameters, let's focus on the key parameters that, um, that impact, uh, you know, I'll speak parochially from a maritime weather perspective. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's collect the key parameters that provide information to the forecasters and to the, and to the forecast models. Um, automate that as much as possible and make that as hands off as much as possible. I think that that will go a long way. And a number of efforts around the world are, 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 are underway to do that. I think another aspect of it is figuring out how to, uh, how to utilize the automated information system, the AIS data streams to be able to transmit some of that information in real time. A number of experiments on that around the world are taking place, one of which is in the U.S. and really is the outcome of the uh, sinking of the El Faro. So, yes, th I, th I think we've got some steps on the way to try to do that. But it, I think it really, I think one of the biggest impediments has really been the, 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 the level of effort required to do it given in, in the face of shrinking crews. Automation so and te yeah. technology be a part of the, the solution, really. So, that, that well, that's interesting. It's an interesting perspective. I have a couple of questions uh, coming in from, from the audience. Um, one from Antran, who is uh, saying um, that we mentioned boy ship and satellite and uh, was wondering if you're also ingesting uh, data from Argo profiling floats in your models. Yes, I, I, and that was, uh, I apologize for that oversight and not having that slide in there. Absolutely. 
Um, that, that information is really critical to uh, uh, ensuring that we've got uh, uh, a good information in the ocean. So yes, that is definitely here. Okay, and I have another one from uh, Johnny Johansson. Um, saying that our regions of possible strong wave current interactions, such as within the Gulf Stream, marked during severe wind events. I'm sorry, Emma. Could you could you say the beginning of that again? I must. I think I missed it. It says our regions of possible strong wave current interactions, such as within the Gulf Stream, marked during severe wind events. Um, I mean, maybe this uh, that I could take. The question two ways, I guess, is it's whether it's marked in the observations, uh, which I think they are, but or are they marked within your um, within your weather forecasting in the information you provide um, as uh, as being locations of, of of possible greater wave current interactions? How, how does that information come across? Yeah, that's a very good question. So so being aware of of what these these you know, knowing where these areas are, we clearly know where the major ocean currents are. Um, we know where the major storm tracks are and where where the areas of either opposing or perpendicular wind flow are creating those conditions. So, yes, we do take that into account in our forecasts that, that are issued by the forecasters. Uh, and we highlight those areas. You know, I, I think I showed you a text message. So we've got those areas highlighted where, where the highest winds are going to be. We've got zone forecast where we highlight that. Um, and then we also do at least uh, highlight, or at least stamp those on the charts. We are looking at more effective ways of trying to do that, though, because I think we can do a better job of highlighting those areas. Um, we, we highlight the location of the north wall of the Gulf Stream on some of our charts, but because the charts get so cluttered and they end up going out in black and white, for example, we, we, we aren't really able to do that on too many of the charts. So we're trying to figure out how we can manage all of this information and ensure that, you know, so, so we at least highlight the hazard, even if we don't highlight all the area, you know, that all of the uh, contributing factors to the hazard. Right. Okay. Well, that's really interesting. Um, I, I have a, it, it seems to me that, you know, the U.S. has taken a very structured approach to improving the, uh, the prediction service, you know, from from the end user perspective, as well as from the forecast and like, you know, the science or the, the operational perspective. Um, when you talk with colleagues uh, around the world, are, do you see sort of similar structure of initiatives, sort of, I don't know, say in the UK or France, are, are people working along similar lines? Yeah, I, I, is, is, and I'll admit to uh, just getting involved in a lot of that, as you know, from my recent involvement in JCOM. So I don't, I, 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 you know, I'm a little concerned about not mentioning a country that is doing. It. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so that said, yeah, there are there are a number of countries, um, and typically those with uh, 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 very advanced uh, uh, meteorological, hydrological services, and, and long-term marine programs that are doing that. I think we're seeing more and more of that from many of the countries who who are med area coordinators, uh, who have that responsibility. Um, I think we've got a number of other countries that are really stepping up. I'm aware Indonesia, for example, is really is really uh, focusing on, on uh, maritime safety, not only through their charting, but also through weather prediction and, and, and ocean prediction. So, so yeah, I think we see that happening throughout the world. I think it's a uh, I, I think part of this is just, you know, thanks to changes and improvements in observational and observational computing and uh, communications infrastructure. I think we're really finding uh, finding our rhythm, if you will, and being able to get the right information. Realize that we can move beyond the forecast and figure out what the users are using, um, what they need, what kind of information they need. And I think there are more and more of the the uh, uh, marine weather services around the world are trying to do that. I think the challenge becomes, and I know this is one of the challenges that we've got in the U.S., is really trying to figure out how to get inside the decision loop um, of, of, of the shipping community, of mariners, fishing, you know, fishermen, whether it's fishermen or cruise ships or, or cargo lines, how do we actually um, better understand, what can we do to better understand how they make their decisions so that we can ensure the right information is provided either yeah. through service itself, depending on what country you are, or the commercial services that we rely on to support, as in the case of the U.S., um, and try to make sure that 
they have the information necessary to make the right decisions to keep their ships, regardless of size and cargo, including people, um, as safe as possible. Right. Okay. That's. Uh, I mean, and, and do you have forums where you kind of get together in some way? That's uh, where the service with the shipping community. Yeah, we're we're working harder on that, frankly. Right. Um, yeah, I think we can continue to do better. Um, I know within the U.S. we're reaching out a lot more than than, than, than we we were before. Uh, yeah. And of course, there's a little bit. It, it's a little bit of a challenge, but I know you know at, at least very parochially, both we at the Ocean Prediction Center and the National Hurricane Center are, are are doing a fair amount of that. National Hurricane Center, in fact, had a had a really terrific uh, uh, seminar with the shipping community down in and around the, the Florida and Caribbean region earlier this year. Right. Okay. Good. So it's a it's a work in work in progress, but certainly heading in that kind of direction. And I guess Ocean Ops 19 uh, might also be an opportunity to sort of link everybody together in that sense. I know that has a, a focus on um, getting industry involved as well. I have a couple of questions that have popped up from Ren Bo Pang. Um, saying that service delivery is critical for maritime security and the AIS is used for service delivery for national weather services. What kind of forecast products can be delivered by AIS such as text or pictures? So is it is it a kind of a, a two-way uh, facility like that? And uh, except IS, uh, are there other ways for service delivery, sort of new service delivery that you're you're looking at? So in terms, to take the question first, uh, in terms of the AIS, we're, we're actually, at least from the U.S. perspective, we're beginning to explore what our options are. Um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's largely text right now. Um, but, but of course, you can send images alphanumeric, right? So with alph alphanumeric strings. So that, that's, that's one option. Uh, but again, I think it's, I'm not in a position to say where that's going to go. I've got some thoughts on it, but they're not very well informed. So we're, we're continuing to work through that. Um, I, 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 another area, another dissemination method that I think is important in getting services out, I had mentioned briefly, was how to get that information integrated to the shipboard navigation picture. So that's where that uh, our work, the, the work between JCOM uh, the, with the US and uh, South Korea and Brazil, I've been working on with JCOM and the International Hydrographic Authority to establish an international standard for weather overlays um, will be very helpful. And then and that means that information would, would make it directly into the navigation picture of a ship at sea so that they can be looking not only at the navigation hazards, but the weather hazards that they need to avoid. I think we also uh, need to prepare ourselves for a future where, um, where, where satellite communications at sea is far more readily available and less expensive than it is now. You know, I, I'll hold up my cell phone here. I'm not sure if everybody really thought even 10 years ago just how useful that was going to be and how much of an integral part of our everyday lives it's going to be. And, and I feel a similar, uh, pardon me, a similar revolution is coming to ships at sea. And I think there's going to be an improved ability to, uh, in a far more affordable manner as uh, new as the next uh, next uh, constellation of Iridium satellites gets up and becomes operational. I've been hearing uh, about all sorts of small sat communication networks being put up. And I think we, we need to position ourselves to figure out how we can transform over time and doing so very carefully, purposefully and methodically, how we can transform ourselves from this, this teletype and HF facsimile based network that we've become so reliant upon to to over time actually be able to take advantage of the satellite communications. I don't think we want to be sending, uh, I don't think it's going to be like the internet at our desk in our office, but I think we can do a better job of providing value added products that, that do a better job of, of conveying the, the hazardous information than we are now. Great. Well, that's, I mean, that's an interesting sort of view of the, the future and we kind of uh, coming up to the to the end of our webinar hour now so I just wondered with one last question whether I'd ask you because we're, we're you know the Goose seminar is speaking to the observing community do you have sort of any any message for the cons uh, for the observing community uh, that you'd like to leave us with um... yes I do uh, first of all thank you for all that you're doing um, when my forecasters come on shift yeah, they're looking at the models, but but actually what I find them doing right away is they're also looking at the, 
the, the observations that they've got available at sea. Yeah, they're checking for the scatterometer data, they're checking for the altimeter data from the satellites, but they're also looking at the buoys, they're looking at the ship bobs, and they're trying to make sure that they've got a clear picture of what's happening in the maritime environment. And programs such as Goose and, and, and that, that collect these observations at sea and make them available for the broader public good um, are critical to their operations. I think uh, uh, my my request would be as as, as as Goose and other programs continue to think about the kinds of sensors and uh, uh, platforms that they're deploying, that they think about it not only from an ocean research perspective and operational oceanography perspective, but also from the, the shorter time problem of maritime weather safety. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I mean, I think from the observing community, I can't speak for everybody, but it's really, obviously it's great to to have a presentation where we see the you know the use of the the observations that are being taken it's really important and at least it's you know one of the big reasons we we all do the observing so i'm going to say thank you very much tom it's been a, a really great presentation and i, I i've uh, seen some some things from you before but it was really uh, interesting to kind of take the run through of the the whole focus of of, of what the U.S. is is doing in terms of these improvements, um, but sort of in a in a global perspective as well. So uh, I think we're we're going to wrap it up here. Um, and uh, I also want to thank all the uh, attendees for tuning in to this uh, this uh, Goose webinar and uh, it will be available we will it's been recorded so we will also make it available on the goose website and uh, yes I, I guess that's uh, I, I'll, I'll bring it to a close uh, here so thank you very very much Tom and uh, let's uh, let's see how things develop and uh, work on getting some more more observations through to the through to the models for you okay thank you Emma. thank you everyone thank you bye Close your video for